this morning then, can we return to that chapter we read in Nahum? Chapter 1 of Nahum. And we will choose verse 15 for our text. Let us read together then our text in Nahum chapter 1 at verse 15. Behold upon the mountains the feet of him that bringeth good tidings, that publisheth peace. O Judah, keep thy solemn feast, perform thy vows, for the wicked shall no more pass through thee. He is utterly cut off. And uh, seeking God's blessing, we want to meditate upon these words in context. The title I would like to give to our meditation is Good News. Good News. I realize that this book might not be too familiar to us. I confess before you that I don't believe I've preached from this book in all the times that I've been in the ministry. This is my first time uh, speaking from the book of Nahum. You might find that the title is somewhat out of place. We have read these words. They are awesome words. They are telling us about the Lord and how he's going to be one who will avenge his adversaries and how he is going to pour out judgment. But I do believe that the title is appropriate and I hope to bring that to your attention as we go through our meditation this morning. We will probably not be too familiar with this book. It's a very small book. It's only got three chapters. Nahum prophesied in the same century as Zephaniah, Habakkuk and Jeremiah. Now the first two of these prophets I've mentioned would be regarded as minor prophets. And so was Nahum. He was a minor prophet. And it was minor in the sense that we don't have much of his prophecies. He's not like Jeremiah or Isaiah or Ezekiel or Daniel, which have much fuller prophecies. We don't know much about the person at all. He came from Elkosh. We cannot identify where that place is. Some would say it was near Galilee. But that is purely speculation. He prophesied during the reigns of Manasseh and Josiah. And that was around the period of 650 BC. 650 BC. 650 years before the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. And during the reigns of Manasseh, if we know anything about Manasseh, we will know that he was a wicked individual. He was a, a wicked king. But he did repent. There was a tremendous transformation in his life. He did repent. And Josiah, who followed him, was a much better king, a much more godly king. Now, this book here is quite unique. His prophecies are in a book. Normally, when the prophet was prophesying, he would speak. And then afterwards, someone, maybe the prophet himself or someone else, would write down what the prophet had said orally. But this one is different. We find there from verse 1, the burden of Nineveh, the book of the vision of Nahum, the El Conchite. And therefore, his book, his prophecies were in a book form, not so much orally as the other prophets were. His name, biblical names, are important. Not like our names, 
they don't mean much, but the biblical names do mean something. And Nahum means compassion and consolation. And again, I put it to you, after we've read these 15 verses, you might say, well, his name is kind of out of place because he's talking about terrible, terrible judgment. But again, friends, that is not the case because his message is a message of good news for the people of God. What basically then was the message of Nahum? Well, basically, in a sentence or two, the message of the book was God's judgment upon God's enemies. God was going to judge his enemies. And when they were God's enemies, they were his people's enemies. And this book here is a book that was written to encourage the people of God that God was going to judge their enemies. And who were their enemies? Well, their enemies were the Assyrians. And where did the Assyrians have their, their capital? But in Nineveh. Now, at this time, at the time of this prophecy, the Assyrians would be regarded as a world power. They dominated the Middle East. Like America today is a world power. China may well be emerging as another world power that might, might one day threaten America. We don't know these things. But at this time, Assyria was indeed a world power and it was dominating that region. And this is something that we might find strange. But the Lord used the Assyrians to chastise his own people. We would find this difficult. This somehow doesn't accord with our view of what God should be like. But that's what God did. Just a wee brief history lesson here will help us. The days of David... And the days of Solomon were Israel's glory days. They reigned and they ruled. They were a united nation. They were a powerful nation and they subdued all their enemies around them. And they lived in peace and in safety. But after the death of Solomon, Israel, the nation, was divided. And it was divided into two. There was two kingdoms. There was a kingdom in the north that comprised ten tribes and it was known as Israel. And then there was the kingdom in the south. It comprised two tribes, Judah and Benjamin, and it was known as Judah. So Israel was divided and it became known as Israel and Judah. Israel, the ten tribes, apostatized. What does that mean? It simply means they began to worship idols and they forsook the worship of the one true and the living God. Or maybe more accurately to say, they incorporated the worship of idols with the worship of God. Whatever, they tampered with the worship of God. And this was a very, very serious thing in the sight of God. And after having sent prophets to them in order that they might repent and turn to the Lord their God and forsake idolatry, nothing happened. They continued on this path, on this road. And ultimately, God handed them over to the Assyrians. The Assyrians came in 722 B.C., and they attacked uh, Israel in the northern kingdom and they captured Samaria and they captured the people of Israel and they took them away into captivity. And they were never returned. And the Lord was using the Assyrians to chastise his people. 
Now the, the Assyrians, because of their victory, they were full of pride. And they were gloating in their military strength. And they said to themselves, well, we have captured the northern kingdom. We have taken Israel. Now we're going for Judah. Now we're going for the southern kingdom. And they tried. And they had some success. They were able to capture some parts of Judah. But then the fatal move. They said, we're going to capture Jerusalem. And one night they surrounded Jerusalem. And to cut a very long story short, the Lord destroyed them. That night when he sent an angel that destroyed over 250,000 of the Assyrians. And they had to go back to their land humiliated. But they were not dead. And they were not buried. They were still the enemies of God. And the people of God were still under fear that the Assyrians would regroup and would come back and they would overcome. This is the fear of God's people. Well, this book here was written in order that the people of Judah who lived under the threat that the Assyrians would come back that that was not going to happen. Why was it not going to happen? Because the Lord was going to deal with Nineveh, which was the great capital of the Assyrians. Now, as I said here, this book here is not too familiar with us. But you might remember the book of Jonah. Now, Jonah prophesied about a hundred years before Nahum. And you will know that Jonah was given the task to go to Nineveh. And he was told to tell the people, 40 days and Nineveh will be overthrown. That was his message. A hundred years before Nahum. And what happened? Well, we know what happened. The people of Nineveh, from the king right down to servants, they obeyed the message of Jonah. In other words, they repented. So Jonah went there with this message to Nineveh a hundred years before Nahum, and the people of Nineveh responded. And what happened? God did not destroy Nineveh at that time. But during that hundred year period, what happened? Well, the Assyrians, the people in Nineveh, they repented of their repentance. And they turned back to their old ways again. Now, the Lord was going to deal with them. And do we realize that this book was not sent to the Ninevites. This book was not delivered to the Assyrians. They got no word of this. Instead, sudden destruction came upon them when they were totally unaware. God had given this book to his people, to the people in Judah, that they might be encouraged. For instance there, verse 9, What do you imagine against the Lord? He will make another end. Affliction shall not rise up the second time. This is what he's saying to them. Assyria came and tried to destroy Jerusalem once. But it will not come again, not rise up the second time. For while they be folded together as thorns, and while they are drunken as drunkards, they shall be devoured as stubble fully dry. Here the prophet is speaking in 
poetic language, in prophetic language. And he's telling about the destruction that's going to come upon the Assyrians. And that destruction was going to come upon them by another nation that God was going to raise up. It was the Babylonians. They were going to become a world power and they were going to take over the kingdom of the Assyrians and they were going to destroy, completely and utterly destroy and flatten Nineveh. And while they are drunken, or drunken as drunkards, they shall be devoured as stubble fully dry. Here we have then the Lord moving and working in the nations and in the kingdoms of this world. Now this might well surprise us. I don't know where you stand on these, on these theological things. I don't know how you stand regarding these biblical things. You might find these things somewhat difficult and somewhat strange. Friends, here we are. We are finding out about the great God of heaven. This is what we're discussing today. This is what we're looking at. We must realize and know that God is active. God is very much active in the affairs of this world. As he was there 650 years before the coming of Christ, so he's active today. You know, there are a group of people, we don't hear much about them, but we might know their thinking and their theology. They're called deists. They're called deists. Now, what is so particular about them? Well, they believe that God has created the world and the universe. They will attribute creation to God. But they say that since God has created the world, the universe, he has somewhat taken a back seat. He has, if you like, wound up the world like a watch. He has wound it up. And he's left it to his own ways and schemes and devices. He takes no part in it. That's what the deists believe. We don't believe that for one moment. Not for one moment. Yes, we believe that God spoke and brought the creation and the universe, the sun, the moon, the stars, into being at a moment's notice. Yes, we believe that. But we also believe that God is imminent. He's in his creation. He is working in it. And he is doing these things in order that he might achieve his plans and his purposes for the cause of Christ. This is what happened here. He was moving and working in order to bless his people. Yes, as we said, he sent the Assyrians to chastise his people. And when they had finished the work, he sent another nation to chastise the Assyrians. There's a verse in the Psalms that we could quote that would help us to understand this. In Psalm 76 verse 10, Psalm 76 verse 10, here the psalmist is saying, Surely the wrath of man shall praise thee. The remainder of wrath shalt thou restrain. Now we're not going to expound that verse, but that verse is basically telling us that God uses evil and wicked men, evil and wicked nations, evil and wicked governments in order to further his plans and his cause. And when they have completed whatever his will has decreed, they will be replaced. Surely the wrath of man shall praise thee. This would teach us, yes, hold on to this friends, this would teach us that in some real way, the devil himself is a servant of the living God. Is that not glorious? Is that not wonderful? Oh, the devil, he, he walks about like a roaring lion seeking whom he may dis destroy. But he's chained. He can only do so much. And yes, he does evil things. 
And God does not make him do evil things. We're not saying that for one moment. But God overrules all things. Even our arch enemy. Even that one who's out to destroy you, Christian. God has him on a lead. He's in chains. And whether he likes it or not, and this is remarkable, he is a servant of the living God. And because of his sinful nature, because he continually resists the living God, he must act according to his nature. That's what he does. Surely the wrath of man shall praise thee. The remainder of wrath shalt thou restrain. The Assyrians would love to overthrow God's people. They were used to chastise God's people. But no more. No more. They couldn't. Why? The remainder of wrath shalt thou restrain. This is our God. This is the God of the Bible. This is the God that we are to worship and to adore. This is the God that we are to acknowledge. This is the God that we come into this building and other buildings on the Lord's day that we might worship the one true and the living God. We don't worship a puny God. We worship a glorious God, an all-powerful God, an all-wise God. That's the God of the Bible. And that's the God you're to love. And that's the God you're to serve. We're not going to talk about the foolishness of what's happening in churches today and denominations when they talk about the gender of God. Oh, how blasphemous it is. We will take our theology from the Word of God. And this is the God that we worship and adore. And this is the message he wants to convey to us today, friends, that all our enemies, all our enemies, and all God's enemies shall ultimately go the way of the Assyrians and the Babylonians that came after them. The Lord will judge them. That's the God of the Bible. Can you then see that this indeed was good news for the people of God? Can you not see this? Can you imagine the people of God having had a scare with the Assyrians? Oh, will they come back? Will they reform? Will they gather their weapons again? Will they come with all their horses and with all their chariots? Oh, they were a wicked and cruel people. They would slaughter them all if they had their way. And the people of God didn't have the resources. Who were they? Who could they stand up against? They couldn't. And here, friends, in our text, what do we find? Behold, upon the mountains, the feet of him that bringeth good tidings. What is happening here? What's he talking about here? Well, here we have this book. This book is telling them that God is going to judge the Assyrians. But they didn't live in a technical age like we are. They didn't have 24-hour news service. In other words, Nineveh could be destroyed and they would know nothing about it. Wouldn't happen today. We would know about it. We could probably watch it live on television. But that, not in these days. They would have to rely upon a messenger. And what do they see? Behold, there's the messenger. Here he's coming on the mountains. And he's bringing good news. And you know, friends, because he's bringing good news about the destruction of the Assyrians, even his feet are beautiful. Behold, upon the mountains, the feet of him that bringeth good tidings. What's the good tidings? The good tidings is that the Assyrians have been destroyed. Your enemies have been destroyed. 
You don't need to fear the Assyrians. They're not going to come in the middle of the night and rape your wives and your, your daughters and take people captive and slay men and do all kinds of horrible things. No, that's all over. And the messenger, even his feet, that would be covered in dust and covered in sores, even his feet are glorious because he brings good tidings that publishes peace. Peace, friends, that's what he's pub publishing. The Lord has intervened. The Lord has done something glorious and wonderful. The Lord has laid bare his holy arm and he has brought about a glorious and a wonderful salvation. Well, we're not Judah. We don't live in 650 BC. We're not frightened of the Assyrians. What can we learn? What can we derive from these things? Well, first thing, generally, we notice that God will judge nations. And by nations we can say governments as well. Dynasties. God will judge. We know we're not talking about the great day of judgment. That day will come, yes, of course. But that's a day when individuals will be judged. There's going to be a great day of judgment. It's going to be an awesome day. And every one of us will stand before King Jesus. Doesn't matter how long it will be. More than likely, we cannot tell, but more than likely all of us here will pass into eternity before that day. Doesn't matter. We'll be resurrected. We'll stand before King Jesus. Your very thoughts, your words, your actions shall be weighed before King Jesus. I put it to you, friends, sincerely, on that day you'll need a saviour. You'll need a saviour. You'll need an interest in Christ. Why? Well, it's clear, we're all sinners. All of us. And God has not changed. God demands absolute perfection. Somehow people think that in the New Testament God has gone light, he's gone soft. No, no, no. It's the same God. He does not change. And the glory of the gospel is we are sinners, sinners by nature, sinners by practice. We cannot save ourselves. We cannot stand before God in our own righteousness, for our own righteousness is but filthy rags. But God is prepared to accept one who has lived a perfect life on our behalf. Who's that? That's the Savior. That's the Lord Jesus. He's come. He's come to this world. He's lived a perfect life. Fulfilled God's law perfectly. Paid the penalty perfectly for that law that was broken. That's why he suffered. That's why he died. He offered up himself a sacrifice. If we will have him as our Lord and Saviour, his righteousness will be given to us. And God will accept what someone else has done on our behalf. That's what we're talking about. We're talking about here individual judgment on that day of judgment. But friends, there's something else. God judges nations here and now. God judges wicked people in the here and now. He does not wait for the day of judgment. You know, friends, Britain, the nation of Britain will not stand on judgment day. Oh yes, there'll be people from Britain in the judgment day. We're not talking about that. But as a nation, 
It will not be nations that will be judged there. Nations are judged in time. Lord, the Lord deals with nations now. As he dealt with Nineveh. As he dealt with Babylon. As he dealt with his own people. He dealt with them in time. And God has not changed. Look at our nation. I know there are no prime ministers here. And there are no first ministers here. And there are no politicians here. But nevertheless... We have to state that the Lord will deal with nations. And nations who were once great and who had once power and who were once to some extent godly and recognized God and had a fear of God about them and whose laws and constitution were shaped and formed by the law of God. Those nations who change from that position, they can expect to be judged. And ours is no different. I believe we are collapsing as a nation. The foundations of our nation are being shaken. And when the foundations are tampered with, it cannot be long before the collapse. And that could be said for Western world in general. God deals with wicked nations in time. But for ourselves, there is good news for the people of God. Here we have in our text, Behold upon the mountains the feet of him that bringeth good tidings, that publisheth peace. This really is a, a picture of the gospel preacher. Here he comes. What good news has he got? Well, he has wonderful news. He has wonderful news from a far country, if you like. He has wonderful news from heaven. And he's wonderful news of something that happened over 2,000 years ago in a far country. I'm going to quote from the book of Proverbs here, verse 25 of chapter 25 as cold waters to a thirsty soul so is good news from a far country now this would apply to these people there this was glorious news this was like a great draft of cold water on a hot thirsty day to hear this good news but the same thing can be said for us friends because God has done something wonderful in the Lord Jesus Christ this is the good news of the gospel. This is good news that has come from heaven, from God himself. This comes with the approval and the stamp of Almighty God. He has sent forth the Lord Jesus Christ. And he has destroyed our enemies. <coughs> These people were told that their arch enemy was destroyed. And they would rejoice. You can imagine them being the people from the Middle East. When they heard of this good news, there would be dancing, there would be great feasting, there would be great rejoicing over this because they were now saved from that enemy. But so it is with the people of God, so it is for you this morning or this afternoon. Is it not true that there is good news in the gospel? What is the good news, you might say? What are our enemies? Our enemies, friends, are not nations, are not people. Our enemies are spiritual enemies. Our enemies are sin itself. This is our greatest enemy. This is something that, that has affected all of us. And it's too strong and it's too powerful that we cannot deal with it ourselves. But hallelujah, the Lord Jesus Christ has dealt with it. The Son of God has come down from heaven and he has dealt with this great problem of sin. He suffered and he died and he paid the price of our sin. And for the people of God, this should cause us indeed to cry out, praise the Lord. He has done something that we could never do. 
And what's more, he has defeated Satan. Oh, here people laugh about Satan, friends, but you only have to look at the world. You only have to look at what goes on and you can obviously see there's something sinister. There's an evil spirit and that evil spirit is Satan. But the Lord Jesus Christ, he resisted him and ultimately he won the victory over him on the cross. There the Lord Jesus Christ suffered and died and the devil thought he had won the victory, but he didn't. How do we know? Well, we know, friends, because on the first day of the week, the Lord's day, he arose. Satan didn't think that this would happen. He thought it was all over. He's dead. He's buried. He's out of the way. But no sealed tomb could keep the Lord Jesus. He truly has won over Satan. You have an enemy. You have a terrible enemy. It's that evil spirit, Satan. And he's telling you at this moment, don't listen to this preacher. Did God really say that? It's an old trick. Sin, Satan, and death have been destroyed. What is it that blights mankind? What is it that causes us not to live according to the way of God? It is sin, it is Satan, and it is death. But the Lord Jesus Christ has abolished death. Behold upon the mountains the feet of him that bringeth good tidings. Good tidings to the people of God. Good tidings to those who will put their faith and trust upon the Lord Jesus Christ. Good tidings today on the 12th of February 2023 that the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ is still efficacious. It still cleanses from sin. It still indeed makes us new. It gives us new life. This is the good news, friends, that Christ has defeated our enemies, that we ourselves could never accomplish. Well, is this good news? Well, it's good news for the people of God. The Lord is good, a stronghold in the day of trouble. And he knoweth them that trust in him. Do you trust in him? This is what matters. Have you reached out? Have you called upon the name of the Lord Jesus Christ? The one who has defeated man's greatest enemies. You must call out to him. You must have him. You must enjoy him. You must serve him. That's what you must do. He knoweth them that trust in him. The good news of the gospel, friends, there's nothing like it. Taste and see that the Lord is good. Amen.